evening, saints. How is everybody doing tonight? We're going to continue our Bible study on prayers in the Bible. And we're going to shift back to the Old Testament. We're going to look at a psalm, a sung prayer that is very well known in the Christian tradition. And um, I'm hoping we can do a little bit of kind of careful work on this. I hope you have something to write on. Um, if you don't, find somebody who does and become their friend. Um, but we're going to turn to Psalm 139. And this is a psalm that folks know really well because it is a psalm that talks about how we are known by God. It's a psalm that explores what it means to be a part of God's creation, specifically what it means to be a human being that is a part of God's created order. And one of the things that I'm going to ask you at several times tonight is the same question, and that is how does this psalm function as a prayer? So we've talked about different types of psalms and what they do. We've talked about psalms of lament and psalms of praise and psalms of thanksgiving and what they do. And as we work through this psalm, I want you to think about how this psalm functions. What does it do and how does it do it? I'm going to read through it first and then we're going to divide it up into sections and work through it. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit and where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me and the light around me become night, even darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, that I know well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O oh God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me, those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them, everybody said, mm. I count them my enemies. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Okay. Now, I just read through that, and I'm going to ask you now to just look at it quietly for a few minutes, and this is what I want you to look for. 
I want you to look for recurring words and themes. What are the words that get repeated in this psalm? And as we look at the words that get repeated, what themes come to the surface? So that one of the things that, um, I'll tell you why I'm doing this. There's a word that we use in seminary, and it's called exegesis, okay? It's a Greek word, and um, many years ago I was teaching, and one of my, many, many years ago, it was about 20 years ago I was teaching, and one of the um, people that I was teaching went and told their pastor that I had told them there was an extra Jesus in the Bible. It's not an extra Jesus, it's exegesis, and it literally means to lead out. All right? So there is a way of interpreting scripture that we can either um, lead out or we can lead in. So leading in is when you open the Bible and you know what you wanted to say before you read it. All right? That's not what we want to try to promote. We want to promote a way in which we allow the text to speak to us. And one of the ways we can do that, and we call this English exegesis, looking at this text we have, is by paying attention to what words keep popping up and whether or not the recurrence of those words will lead us to some of the themes. Okay, so let's just take two, maybe three minutes, and let's see what words we can list, and then if we can come up with some themes in this psalm, in this prayer. Okay, let's stop wherever we are. No, we didn't get them all, but I'm sure we have a good list. Um, what are some of the words that seem to repeat themselves that seem to pop up? Okay, mind. Someone said knowledge. There. <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, wait, wait, wait. My, me. Shall. Okay, okay, like will, okay. What else do we have? Hmm? And? 
Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. No. If. Yes. Darkness. Presence. Hmm? Heart. I was going to say, is that okay? Got it. Anything else? Okay, I didn't hear any of that. Oh, God. Oh God. Someone said? Search. Search. Oh, it is? Yes, it is. Okay, and oh, God. Anything else? Lord. Lord. Creation. What? Okay. 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 Let's, th let's take that list and look at the first six verses. So now I want to work through this. Now, if you look at this list, can you begin to pick up anything? Anything that might be a theme that runs throughout? <laughs> Omnipresence, which means God is everywhere, okay? Um, you want to give us the other two while you're at it? No. Okay. God is all-knowing. So you've got there, all-knowing. So at least these two, God is everywhere, and God seems to know everything. Okay, so let's look at these first six verses. Now, I just circled verbs. Searched, known, know, sit, rise, discern, search. Acquainted, know, hem, lay, so that you have a lot of knowing and not just knowing and head knowledge, but the sense of prodding and experiential knowledge. Yes? And we've talked about the word in Hebrew for know, and that we've got a couple of words here. We have discern, we have know. And we have search. Right? And we have acquainted. And the pronouns here would be I, you, me, right? So that all of this knowing and searching and acquaintancing is happening between two entities, between the psalmist and between God. So even though we say that, this, that the psalms in general are about this relationship between the person and God, this psalm is that on steroids. It is magnified, the level to which this is a relationship between an individual and God. And we know that this word no yada is not simply about head knowledge, it is about experience. So when it says, God, you know me, it doesn't simply mean you know about me or you know everything that I do, but you know about me because you are with me. You are going through the experiences. You are aware of what's happening because you are there. All right? So there is nowhere you can go that God is not. So when we talk, I was just talking to my son about this in the car about how important it is, or one of the tests of someone's character, is that what you do when no one's looking. That we all kind of know how to like perform. You know, if you got a little bit of training, you know how to like look right and act right and straighten up when the people who are important to you show up. But what about when there is no one else? What do we do in those moments? And this understanding of God's presence means you are never alone. There is never a time when there is no other there. And the one that is always there 
is the one who matters most. So there is in these first six verses this sense of intimacy that comes from God's presence, God's omnipresence, all present, ever present, but it is connected not just with space, but with a series of actions. So that we go from sitting and rising. And then it's not just what I do, but what I think. So it's not, again, this sense of God kind of being removed, watching. You know how we always think of God up in heaven looking down. But if God knows my thoughts, God is right there. This imminent presence of God. So God is not the superintendent who's with a checkbook that's checking off and marking off what we're doing. God is in it with us. Think about the implications for that then in terms of where we go and who we're with. There's a way in which you bring God with you wherever you go, for better or for worse, because sometimes we're in places where we have no business being, but we, God is with us. We bring God with us. Verse 6, the psalmist is amazed at the extent of God's presence, the way in which God is everywhere. So in these first six verses, we have this sense of God knowing us and being everywhere. What do we want to do with the verb in verse 1 that says, you have searched me? What does it mean that God has searched us? Hmm? Okay, it's a different kind of knowing. It's investigative. It's extensive. All right? So God's God's knowledge of us is God's experience of us, God's observance of us, God's presence with us. Think about all the ways that you know to be. God is in it. All right? And this is interesting because we rarely think about God being present like that all the time. We don't. We do not realize how imminent God's presence is. There are times when we are going through a difficult time and we feel like God is far from us. There are times when we feel lost and we want to get with somebody that we know is close to God. We always have God with us, which means God's presence is not in any way connected to the way we feel. How you feel about your relationship with God has absolutely nothing to do with God's ongoing and abiding presence. So when we say, I feel like I'm far from God, that's how you feel. But it's not reality. So, how does this psalm function as a prayer? In these first six six verses, what does this psalm do? Communicates. Communicates what to whom? It communicates our knowledge of of God to God. Yes? Okay, that's right. What else does it do? Can you come to the mic? Because I know I'm I'm feeling it. Somebody's going to get upset. One of these weeks, I'm going to bring prizes for the people who go to the mic. Don't know when it's coming, but it's coming. I'll be the first one to accept that prize. (laughs) Um, I remember one time, a minister being here, and he preached on the First Thessalonians 5, 17, which says, pray without ceasing. So this psalm reminds me that because God is with us all the time, that we can communicate with him all the time. That's right. Yeah. That's right. We can always communicate with God. And this psalm is a communication with God. But I want you to consider that there's another thing this psalm does. There's another function it has other than communicating with God. Sorry, I think 
that uh, this psalm is uh, establishing the relationship, how, how, God, how God is so much more than we are, and we can't comprehend how okay. magnificent God is. It okay. is letting us know just how powerful and how magnificent God is. It is letting who know? The per, me, the person, or the, uh, well, the, the, the person. Yes. The person knows. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it has a function in terms of communicating to God, but it communicates something to the person who's praying. Okay? Yes. Uh, uh, what I see in this is the psalmist communicating his total dependence on God. Yes. That he made him, he knows everything about him, every step, he knows every step before he makes it, God knows. Yes, so he's acknowledging this total dependence on God. Like, I think I'm doing this, but in reality, I can't even do it without you. Okay, yes? What I read, especially when I get to the sixth verse, yep. and, and it says, it is high and I can't attain it. After the psalmist talks about you understand, you comprehend, it says to me, God, I humble myself before you. Yes. Now I can open up and pray. Yes. You know, what's interesting about this is it's a psalm about how much God knows, and all the while it's saying how much God knows, it says, I can't know how much you know. I can't even comprehend the extent to which you know me. All right, so it's this kind of, um, this, is, this is all I've got. I know, like, I know when I lay down, I know when I get up. I know how I think, I know where I go. And I know that your knowledge of me covers that. But I, but I can't, but that's as far as my knowing about your knowing can go. So there is this differential, yes. Um, I see the first six verses and actually some that follow almost as, um, as a praise and he's worshiping God prior to the petitions that he then later yes. on puts forth. So I see this as opening up the relationship and it's all praise and worship. It's like, you know, yeah. It is praise. <laughs> and also the knowledge of God, the attributes of God. He is discerning, he searches. He does all of these things that um, the psalmist is praying to us to let us know these attributes of God. Okay, who, who is discerning the attributes of God? He is telling the, the psalmist. In the, yes, in this description. For whom? Who is he discerning them for? For for knowledge, for himself, for knowledge. Yes. For so himself. part of what we do when we pray, we do this all the time at Alfred Street. Part of what we do when we pray is remind ourselves of who God is. And the act of reminding yourself of who God is fixes half of what's wrong. Let's be honest. You come to prayer because you've got a list of prayer requests, all right? I don't like the people at my job. I don't, you know, I've got a problem. And it's, you know, you might, and I, I don't mean to make light of this. We have things that are real concerns. But in the first part of the prayer where you start talking about who God is and what God is capable of and the fact that you're breathing and standing because of God, oh, oh, well now you're, you're already fixed before you make your request because you have to remember who God is. Part of the function of prayer is not just to tell God what we need, but to inform ourselves, to remind us of who we are in God. All right? So that how much of what happens in our lives changes when we remember who we are in God. And that the act of praising God and the act of worship does something for God, it does something for us too. All right? So don't ever be stingy with praise. All right? It's the gift that keeps on giving. All right? So that's the first part. Now let's go to this second part. And let's again, let's pay attention to the language. Let's see what we get. Where can I go? Where can I flee? If I ascend, look at the action here. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand will hold me fast. Um, let's stop there first. Let's go 7 to 10. What do we have in 7 to 10? 
me in this cave. This is right. There's nowhere you can go where you can get away from God. Is this, how can I ask this? There's nowhere we can go where we can get away from God. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? Okay, so that, <laughs> that's wrong. He said yes. Um, because you would think if there's nowhere I can go to escape, it, does it feel like we're being imprisoned or confined? That's not the sense here. It's not that, because you say escape, that usually means that you want to get away. It's not that we are um, confined or imprisoned. It is, though, that there is a net of security. All right? And it's something that we're not even aware of. I love the way that one of the prayers, it's one of those lines that people have been praying for generations, protecting us from danger seen and unseen. All right? And the fact that many of us are here and survived the ages of 19 to 24, right? When you really did think you were invincible and you could go anywhere you wanted to go and do anything you wanted to do, that it was the fact that God's presence was there protecting us that allows half of us to be here tonight. So it's not the sense of being contained, but it is a sense that God's protection goes with us everywhere. So you get all of this action. So there are movements in this. If you think about the first part, this knowing and thinking and speech in the first six verses, and knowledge that's beyond my understanding. But in this second one, there's all this movement, all right? And it's not just to um, places we can get to. It's heaven and hell. Well, I don't know, but, you know, last time, we don't get there when we want to. We get there when it's your time to go. But this sense of places where you can go, um, even there, verse 10, your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me fast. Even there, even when I'm in a place where I have no business being, even there, your right hand will hold me. Okay? This is the favorite verse of parents of young adults. Right? Even there, God is there. Right? Now, look at verses 11 and 12. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me becomes the night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. So go back to creation where God creates order by separating the light from the darkness. All right? Two separate entities. And that the darkness can be dispelled by even a small light. But for God, this differentiation doesn't exist. All right? So that the things that limit us do not limit God. And this is one of the things that's so powerful about this psalm is that one of the, 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 the things that gums us up in our walk with God is that we continue to think of God in human terms because that's all we know. And so we know God is great, we know God is bigger, but we still only can, all we can experience is what we can experience as human beings. And what this language does is break up some of the fundamental distinctions that we have, all right? The reason that it's no big deal to God that you're going through a difficult time is because it's not dark to God. You can't see your way. God's good, all right? You don't know what's going to happen, but God does. And so we take confidence just in being with the one for whom it is not darkness. All right? And that's one of the things that this psalm opens up for us. Yes, yes. When we have a hard time, we get right up underneath God. Right? Don't miss a prayer meeting. Right? <laughs> it's true. So it is this sense. So then, in, if you pursue that a little bit further, it gets even more curious. Because then you begin to think about how, if, if, God, if we were to think about God feeling in the way that we feel, then we would say that those times are precious to God. 
um, it wouldn't feel that way to us. But to God, that closeness, that intimacy, it's not that God enjoys or takes pleasure in our suffering, but that God enjoys the intimacy. So um, my, I, have a, I have old big children. My youngest child is 15, and he's a very nice young man. But it pains me that he is growing up because he was the one who was very close to me. He's the one that always wanted to be with mommy, and now it's, that's all gone. It's gone. But he's sick. Aha. Uh -huh. And it's like, all of a sudden, it's like it all comes back, you know? And it's like, I don't want the child to be sick. I don't want him to be debilitated. But I would be lying to you if I said I didn't enjoy that uninterrupted time. Um, and I just wonder about how, how it must, if we were to talk about God in terms of that sense of you come, you come back home. You come back home, you know. Okay, that's the second part. Let's move to the third part. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end, and I am still with you. Okay. Um, our lives have a beginning and an end. And it's one of the most frustrating things about human existence that we know that we are going to die. And there's nothing in us that ever really wants that. Unless we are in so much pain that it becomes difficult to live. So we are limited in, we, in, in, our, in the time and space that we can occupy. But there is something in us that longs to go on forever. This psalm talks about God knowing us before we knew our own existence. And if you move from that darkness in the second section that says, the darkness is as light to you. Think about the things that are beyond us in terms of all that really happens in the womb. Now, nowadays, we've got that special 3D thing where you can actually, you know, you can see the baby in the womb waving hay. I mean, it's very, very um, advanced. And now they even have um, surgery that can be done. You know, we're breaking into performing surgery on children in utero. Um, but with all that we know, there are still mysteries about all that happens in the womb. But those mysteries are not mysteries to God. And to, to start with this imagery of what it means that God knew us before we even had fingers. Um, what, what were we that God knew? All that we are, our soul, our whole essence is known and God not only knows that part of us, but God knows us at the end of our lives. And so there's a way in which we want to move away from the anxiety and fear that comes with dying. Because the same God who is with us before we come into this world is there with us along the way in ways that we cannot completely understand. I find this so reassuring for so many reasons, um, but the sense of your, in your book were written all the days that were formed for me, okay? I'd like to think that means that we don't have to be afraid because God already has marked out our days. And God knows what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. And that should alleviate some of the fear and anxiety about, should I do this, should I do that, that 
it's already known to God. And that, that knowledge that God has, go back to verse 6, is so wonderful that we cannot attain it. Look at 17, how weighty to me are your thoughts, how vast is the sum of them. So that this psalm tries to use language to explore the ways in which God knows us. So I really struggle with this psalm just because, you know, we had the discussion last week on free will versus not having free will. So if it's saying that God knows everything that we possibly could do, so I'm thinking, okay, if I make a bad decision, then is that going to, does God know that I'm going to make that bad decision? And then if I do not make that bad decision? Does God know I'm not going to make that bad decision? And if I do make a bad decision, is it going to change the whole trajectory of my life because I made a bad decision? Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. That's Pastor Wesley's question, but I'll try to answer. Okay. So there's this, um, some of you know this children's book called Choose Your Own Adventure. If you don't know this book, it's great. It's like for second and third graders. And you read chapter one, and at the end of chapter one, you have to make a decision. And if you choose option A, you turn to page 17. And if you choose chapter, you choose option B, you turn to page 23. And you can die in this book, depending on the decisions you make. It's, kids love it, because it's like, because then you die, but then you go back to the beginning and go, well, I'm not going to make that choice again. So you go back through, and you can go through, and there are like, you know, 17 possible endings, depending on the choices you make. And what I'd like to think is that God's knowledge of us is like that. That if we go this way, God knows what's going to happen. But it's a series of choices. But that what, what is on the borders of that are that our days are numbered. God knows what all the possibilities are. And part of the problem for me in answering that question is we can only answer it in terms of how we know. But how God knows may make our question obsolete, if that makes sense. That somehow God's knowing is more than a linear knowing. I think God's knowing is kind of, I don't know, bubbly and organic and ever evolving. So that there's a way in which God can know all of it, but we can't. Okay? So that's the Judy Fentress Williams version. But if you want a kind of more systematic answer, then ask Pastor. I think he'll be back next week. All right? Oh, the, <laughs> it's a series called Choose Your Own Adventure. Okay, they're for kids, but they're great. So, you know, um, yeah. Um, not, not religious, but fun, nevertheless. Okay. Um, look at... Um, 17 and 18, again, where we talk about weighty God's thoughts, vast, I try to count, they are more than the sand. All of those, to me, um, try to approximate the limitations we have in comprehending God. So there are two things going on. One is that God knows us, and the other is that we are limited in how we can know God. So even as we attempt to know we can only know so much, but know this one thing. God knows us in every way that we can be known, and it is more than enough. That we come to the end, and I am still with you. Okay? Now, the first part of this psalm, Psalm verses 1 through 18, is really lovely, and it's all about how God knows us and how God is with us, and it's great. And then we get to verse 19. Now, kill the wicked. <laughs> Just love how that switches up, right? Oh, that you would kill the wicked and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe them who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Okay, so we think about how the psalm functions in the first part. And someone said it was a psalm of adoration or a psalm of praise that is praising and acknowledging God. What are verses 19 to 22 doing? Petitioning for what? Yeah, let's just get to it. Kill them. Kill the wicked. Okay? So that seems 
like an abrupt transition. Seems like first we're just talking, it's just me and God, me and God, the Lord and me. And then this shift to not just somebody else, but kill them. Okay? So what, what do you think happened here? I don't know how else to ask that. Part of me would like to think, I would like to get rid of all those people who cause harm and evil things so we could have a perfect world. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I'm thinking about how much God knows me and how I am known by God. But as I think about that, does that somehow then lead to me thinking about the rest of the world? And that not everyone, there are people who aren't even trying to, to have this relationship with God. Okay. Any other? Come to the mic. Can you come to the mic? I was um, just going to say, um, who causes, who are these people that are wicked? I mean, <laughs> don't we all have good and bad in us? I mean, she said, get rid of all the people who do harm. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out who are the people that do harm and who are the people that do good. Yes. Aren't they kind of... That's a good question. The same, yeah. almost. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question because there, we, would, we would have to acknowledge that we all fall short, right? But here the psalmist is making a clear distinction, a line between those who serve God and those who are not. All right? I'm not saying it's right, but he, that's what's happening here, okay? I think also it's saying that we all have these thoughts in other words, if somebody does us wrong or if we see somebody, we just don't like them and we just have, you know, all these exercises in our minds of what we would like to do to them and what we would like God to do to them. But finally, you know, it's a thought. But then we come back to God and acknowledge, you know, okay. who he really is. Okay. And I think the next verse takes us. We're you not know, there yet. I'm not going to let you go there yet, though. Okay. All right. Um, yes. Thank you. Okay, I think in this psalm, you see David like kind of really acknowledging the beauty of God mm -hmm. and how awesome he is, how magnificent he mm -hmm. is. And it, it puts the human, human in perspective. Like you see how beautiful God is. God is. It makes you see how evil man is when okay. you compare yeah. him with the extreme beauty of God and of yes. his ways. Because Good. even David acknowledges that he too, at the end of that um, chapter, mm -hmm. David acknowledges that he too, if there's any wickedness in him, then Again, God don't, should. Don't go there just yet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it just helps him. It's sure when you worship God, you see how far we are from God and how Good. different we are from God. Good. And right, so that we see our own capacity for, for sin. Um, but we usually see the capacity for sin in other people more readily than we do in ourselves. If we're honest, right, that's it's usually how it starts. Yes? Uh, you said people who serve God and people who don't. Um, I never saw my dad go to church. I mean, not once ever in my life did I see him go to a church. But he was the sweetest, gentle, most kindest person I've ever met. So, I don't know. I don't think I disagree with that. People who serve God and people who don't. Uh, you're, you're right, but that's not what the psalmist is doing right now. Mm -hmm. You are absolutely right when you say that we all have good and we all have bad. That we all have the potential for good and the potential for bad. You are absolutely right. And I want you to hear me when I say that. Yes? yes. It is also the case that we often categorize people. We do it all the time. We call our enemies evil, and somehow we are not, right? So that the way we justify going to war is that we call the enemy something like the axis of evil, right? So are they not also good people? Do they not also do good things? But we do have this human tendency, yes? So I'm not, you're right when you say we all have good in us. 
but we also want to acknowledge the fact that we also have a tendency to say, here are the good people and here are the bad. Yes? I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying it happens. Okay? Yes? Um, I was just going to say, I, I kind of picked up from it that there's kind of a point in the prayer where um, the psalmist was really being authentic with God. And so the possibility yeah. that that may be what he's struggling with could possibly be the reason why um, the prayer was started in the first place. And so a lot of times we come with struggles, but because it's God, we try to flower it up. But yeah. once you acknowledge that he already knows everything about you, yes. then you have to open all the way up. And so yes. it was just kind of that point where, okay, I acknowledge the greatness of God. Yes. I acknowledge that you know everything about me. So let's just put it all on the table. Like yes. this is what I'm dealing with and this is how yes. I feel. And so it's getting it all the way out there because That's right. God already knows that complexity. So it's Good. no need to window dress it. Like Well said. That's right. If we're going to be honest, if we're going to be open, it is also the case that there are times when we have these feelings about other people. Okay? And sometimes we dress it up in religious language. So it's not that we dislike this person, but they don't have any fear of God in them, right? When that's not really the issue. The issue is we don't like them. And so we, we can kind of characterize them in a negative way using religious language and religious terms. But it, there is something about this that is honest and open. Okay, yes. <laughs> Well, there is something that's honest and open about it, but I guess I was going to what David was saying and, and, and making an assumption that maybe David's talking about something that he's really experiencing. That he, you know, you say we come to God with our problems. You know, this was his problem before he started this yeah. prayer. Okay. And he seems to be saying that my problem is with those people who are a problem to you, God. Yeah. They hate you. Uh -huh. They talk maliciously about you. They uh -huh. are trying to take away from who God is. Yeah. And, um, you know, that it's one of the things that we know about David. He, he knew how to worship. Yeah. He knew how to be where God was, that he understood that God was where he was too. So he, 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 had, a, he had an ability to be in the spirit. And, and you know, I, I, I was kind of looking, I look at this prayer and saying, he, he, he's talking about those things that, that he knows is contrary to God's. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking he was having some problems with some folks who ah, were trying to... <laughs> trying to what? He was, he was right. having some problems with some folk as the person who was God's anointed. Who was God's anointed. So they didn't just hate God, they hated right. him. Exactly. Okay? So it's a little complicated. Yeah. All right? Okay. I think that was pretty much what I was going to say, too, as well. Um, just that um, the psalmist paralyzed, parallels himself um, with God and my enemies are your enemies. We're on the same, we're on the same team, so can you take care of yeah, them for both of us? Yeah, and they're your enemies, could you really do them in? Since, right? This, yes. Apart from David's own personal uh, circumstances that he brought, we have to remember that back then, when there were enemies of God, whether it was idolatry or disobedience or whatever, the punishment was collective. So everybody got taken into captivity and yes, everybody yes. experienced pe pestilence and yes. famine and these sort of things. So That's a good uh, point. why not just punish the ones who are responsible and yeah. cut us all, the, the rest of us a little slack? Yeah. That's good. All right. So I wanted to stay on those verses before we got to the end because I want, there's a reason that those verses kind of are separated from the rest. So you have this sense of, God, you search me, you know me, you know who I am, you know all about me. Then you get this, I hate those wicked people who hate you, um, hate them with a perfect hatred, I count them my enemies, and then search me and know my heart. 
test me and know my thoughts. So now this invitation to search me, why? Because there may be a wicked way in me. All the while I'm acknowledging what's wrong with somebody else, I have to acknowledge my own capacity and potential to become your enemy. So all the while I'm saying I really don't like the way those people are behaving, I have to say, and I could be that person. I might be that person right now and not know it, which is why I need you to search me and try me and see if there is a wicked way in me. Okay, And that level of honesty, of once we can acknowledge that God knows all there is to know about us, and then, since, since it's all out there, to go ahead and then honestly say how we feel about those that we perceive as wicked, and then to be able to move from that with the understanding that my perception of who's right and who's wrong in the end is not what counts. It's your perception of who's right and who's wrong. And for that reason, even as I'm asking you to deal with my enemies, I need you to deal with me. And that's the piece that balances it out. All right? I'm not the judge. You are. I don't know enough. I can't go to all the places where you go, which means any time I make a judgment about anyone, it's based on my limited perception, my limited experience and knowing of them. So the only judge can be God. And if I'm going to be in the business of asking God to get somebody, I have to be in the business of asking God to search me. So now how does that change my prayer? <laughs> what if God finds something in me? Okay. How does that then transform the way I pray for and about my enemies? All right. So this psalm is fascinating in the way that it uses language to try to approach God's way of knowing. We come to the limits of language. So the, the psalm talks about the limits of our existence that God goes to. If I go to heaven, that's as, as high up as we know to go. Sheol, the place of the dead, that's as, that's, those are the limits of what we know. And if I could get there, God would be there. But all the while I say that, I have to acknowledge that God's existence and God's knowing exceeds what I can imagine or even how it works, so that the questions we ask about the nature of God are a reflection of our limitation. That doesn't mean they're not good. That's just where we are, all right? So here we are using language to express the limits of what we can know. And at the end, the psalmist is also inviting the one who can know more and know in ways that we cannot to search us and to know us. It is the invitation for um, intimacy with the creator and an opportunity, if you will, to kind of be reoriented back to the purpose for which we are made. Okay? Any more questions about this passage? I want to invite you to think about what it means to be known by God. I'm sorry, yes. Um, go going back to those, to the verses um, that slay the wicked and all that, is, is it possible that... W what verses? I'm sorry. Um, that whole section of 19 through 22. Okay. Is it, is it possible that David was asking for permission to hate them or... <laughs> I think he already does. Okay. He says, I hate them. He's not, can I? He's there. 
or, or just, I guess, I guess, part of it's my own discerning. Like, if you're in the process of discerning if, if someone or some entity is good or trying to discern, like, if I should work with them or partner with them or be in relationship with them and you have these negative, hateful <laughs> kind of things, is there a part of you that, or part of David or part, a way to say, I feel like they're evil and I want you to get them, Lord, but at the same time, I know I'm not supposed to hate them. Almost at, like permission to say, no, I need to leave them alone or something. Do you, are you following <laughs> like what my... Yeah, I'm, yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. I think that the psalmist is, is a little further. Okay. I don't think the psalmist is asking permission. I think the psalmist is saying this is where I am with these people. And um, so, so you might be in a different place than the psalmist. And that's okay. Um, okay, it, does, does that help? Yeah, I, th I think it was, I was probably answering my own question or just wondering, like, could he be asking permission, like, Lord, is it okay for me to hate them? But, okay, <laughs> not the hate part. <laughs> but I know, well, not the hate part. But, but um, yeah. I mean, not the, just in the general feelings of the loathing. And, yes. You know. and, and, and I've said this before when we've talked about Psalm 137. When you are in prayer, I, I feel like all bets are off. This is a space where you can say to God whatever is on your mind, all the while you say it, saying, fix me. All right? That we're not supposed to come to prayer fixed. Why then do, would we need to do it? And this is the place where you really can be honest. This person has gotten on my last nerve. And that's polite language. Right? That is where we, um, okay, I'll put it this way. When I said at the beginning, when you acknowledge who God is, that that fixes half the things we came to request, right? So you come to prayer. By the time you get finished saying who God is, then all of the things that you came with are already smaller, right? So in this situation, if you acknowledge who God is and how God knows you and the possibility on the other end that everything in you isn't on the up and up, how does it have an impact on how you feel about your enemies? Does that help? Okay. Any other questions? Not that I've had many enemies, but I, I think that when you really feel strong about something, if you find a way first to pray for it yourself, really pray on it and then you can go to that person and you know the scripture says if you have yes. ought against someone yes to go to that person yes so maybe you can find a way to go to that person and just go out for lunch just go out yes. and just you know it's amazing how some things just work out yeah if you just lay everything out not that that is Oh, some people, maybe you feel like you just can't go there with no, them. No, no, you're absolutely right. Scripture has laid out for us what to do when you have an issue with someone. Um, what I want to just hold on to, though, is that I don't think we spend enough time talk, giving people permission to give it to God. So before you get to the place where you're ready to go meet with them, sometimes we need to spend a little bit more time on our knees getting it all out. And then God, and another thing. And to be honest in that, because God knows it anyway. So the whole point of going to prayer and trying to dress up is it's just a waste of your time. If you understand that God knows you, why not just go and be honest, right? What? Yes, that's right. You understand my thoughts are far off. So the jig is up. God knows how you feel. God knows. So just say it because I do think that the act of prayer does so much to transform us. And that we need to stop thinking that being holy and being godly means trying to conceal it. Being holy and being godly means giving it to God. And the trick is, unfortunately, what happens is if you don't give it to God, it's going to come out in some other way, right? Like all your prayers are directed towards that person. And Lord, like nobody else knows. It's like, so let's just give it 
to God in all of its messiness and let God do what God's going to do. Now, that's exactly yes. what I was going to say. Oh. Um, what I meant by that is, uh, you know, when you get to a certain level, yeah. you don't worry about the other person. You know, maybe David hadn't gotten to that yeah. part of his life where you take care of yourself and God. Yeah. You know, because God is going to take care of the other. So you don't tell God, I want you to do this, I want you to do this, I want you to do this to him, to her, yeah. to her. You know, you pray for you and you pray to make yourself a better person yeah. th so that you can just ignore a lot of things that go on. Now, I know you can't ignore people slaying you and know, all yeah. that stuff, you know, <laughs> but what I'm saying, what yeah. I think is that you don't, you don't ask God to do anything yeah. of that nature. He, yeah. he will take care of it. Yeah. And, you're, and you're, you, should, you should have reached that level in your life which I don't think at that point David had, yeah, where he would just right. say, could rest assured that this will be taken care of. That's right. That's right. That's the way I feel. Thank you. Uh -huh. Well, we should close on that note. So let's stand to pray. Mm -hmm.